Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Which RTX 2080 should you buy? I have seven graphics cards here to compare. We have performance tests, sound tests, temperature test, and even overclocking test. This video is chock full of information to help you pick out your next high-end graphics card. Linked in the video description below will be links to Amazon and Newegg for all of these cards and several other comparisons I've done as well, such as which RTX 2060 should you buy, which RX 580 you should buy, and a few others will all be down there in the description below. The advice in this video today applies not just to the RTX 2080, but also to the 2080 Ti, and even to a large extent to the 2070. Most 2070, 80, and 80 Ti cards are fairly similar between the manufacturers, sometimes with small differences. So if you like, for example, one card of a specific model with a specific cooler from one brand, you'll probably like it whether you move up or down a notch. It also applies to the upcoming Supers. NVIDIA is gonna be launching a refreshed version of all of these cards very soon with about 15% more performance for a similar price point. They are enhanced cards, but they're effectively the same thing with just a boost. So everything I'm about to say here today applies to the Supers as well. All of the benchmarks you're about to see in today's video will run at 4K resolution. The purpose there is to make sure these cards are fully maxed out and were GPU limited so you can see the true performance of these graphics cards. The i9-9900K at 5 GHz was used for the CPU base to run these cards, but I don't think 4K resolution is really the ideal number for these. You can, but if you want to play the latest and greatest games, I think RTX 2080s are ideal for 1440p resolution, either standard or one of the nice, beautiful ultra-wide monitors. If you truly want to play all new games at 4K, it's 2080 Ti or bust. These cards would not be out of place even at 1080p resolution if you're looking for 144 to 240 frames per second if you are wanting extreme performance. But this video isn't about how fast these cards are, it's about which is the best and which is not. Which should you buy? Is it worth spending extra money on a premium card? Now, some of you watching this video may look at the length of the video and go, how many tests and benchmarks are in this thing? I just want the answer, man. Which one is the best? Which one should I buy? I do hope you all stick around and see it because I put a lot of work into it. But if you want the short and sweet answer, I will give it to you right now. These cards start at $700, at least in the United States anyway. And for $700, you can buy a very nice card. This Gigabyte Gaming is a great example of a $699 card, triple fans, it does the job, but I would not buy that. I would spend $800 and get a premium card. At this price point, I'm of the opinion that if you're buying $700 worth of graphics cards, an extra $100 to get a premium experience, a cooler and quieter running card is worth it. There are four cards that I would personally spend my own money on right now. The EVGA For The Win 3, the MSI Gaming X Trio, the ASUS ROG Strix, and then the Gigabyte Aorus. Not the gaming here, but the one with the larger fans, and it's about $800, same as the others. Cooler, quieter, more overclockability, and RGB, because that makes the cards faster, right? I understand not everybody cares about RGB, but those cards generally either have nicer backplates, more ports, uh, they've got larger fans, which means they can run quieter, they boost a little bit higher, and they just, they're just built better. And of course, being a cooler running card, they're more likely to last longer. And when you go to resell them in a couple of years, assuming you do sell your cards, the premium cards do tend to go for more money, so you recoup some of that on the back end. I understand people buying budget cards in the $200 price range may not follow that logic so much, but at this rarefied era of the graphics card industry, I do think spending the money on the premium cards is worth it. That being said, we're going to overclock some of these and show you how you can get premium card performance out of the budget cards if you don't mind a little bit more temperature and a little bit more noise. The one caveat to everything I just said, if you don't mind spending $900, let me point you to that thing right down there. That is the Extreme Aorus card, 240 millimeter liquid cooler. If you want 2.1 gigahertz on your card with overclockable RAM and a cooler, quieter running card than most of these at stock, that is impressive. But it is $200 more than the base cards. And while it's faster, 
Honestly, it isn't $200 faster, so dollar cost per frame per second, it's not as good, but I'm gonna show you some shots of that here in a minute, and it is gorgeous. First, I wanna show you four of these cards benchmarked in quads. I'm gonna put up four results at the same time so you can compare them side by side. The ASUS ROG Strix, the EVGA XC Ultra, the Gaming X Trio from MSI, and the AMP by Zotac. MSI Afterburner is providing us the real-time performance numbers in the upper left-hand corner of each screen, and as you can see, I have the labels up as well. The clock speeds of each of the cards are there. Notice that the Ultra XC is a little bit lower than the others. The others are triple fan, higher-end cards. The EVGA for the Win 3, which I'll talk about in just a second, is more equal to the others, but it demonstrates one of the differences when you go to a lower tier card. I'll show you that gigabyte here in just a minute. Look at the frame rate difference. There's very, very little. You're at about 52 frames per second here on the three triple fan cards, and you're at about 50 frames per second, maybe one or two less on the dual fan card. As you can see there, the cards were very, very similar with the EVGA being not quite as fast because it's not the top end premium card. It's only a two fan card. Get the For the Win 3 for a minor extra amount of money. You'll have a better overall experience or take one of the others. Now there's one card that you're not gonna see in these tests and it's the ASUS dual fan card. Now this particular one I was testing and I ran into a problem. One of the fans failed and I, while well, I did record it that way, Boy, these things run really hot and really loud when only one fan is turning. So I need to get this card RMA'd, but uh, you're not gonna see it in the results. And to be honest, while I was testing it where both fans worked, it was still loud and frankly, not that nice. There's less than $100 price difference between it and the ROG Strix. Get a ROG Strix. Performance and temperatures are great, but how loud are these cards? This next sequence is recorded with the microphone two feet directly above each of the video cards, and the video cards were under load in the game running the benchmarks. So I'll be quiet and let you listen to each of them in sequence. The recordings you just saw were not modified or altered in any way. Obviously, the speakers or headphones you're listening to are going to change how those sounds come across. To my own ears, the ASUS ROG Strix and the MSI Gaming X Trio were the quietest of those four cards, very, very close to each other. The EVGA was just a little bit louder, not terribly so. And then, strangely enough, the triple fan Zotac Amp was the loudest of those four cards, at least to my ears. The Zotac Amp Extreme, which is a bit more money, might be quieter, but I don't have one. But if I had to pick between those four cards, I would take either the Gaming X Trio or the Asus ROG Strix personally. I mentioned at the beginning of this video overclocking results. Let's start off with the Gigabyte Gaming right here. $699, it is the least expensive card here on the desk. Can you make that card run as fast as these cards do? Yes, you can, but at the cost of heat and noise. I'm gonna show you three benchmark results now, and I'm gonna show you the sound of them as well. The first one is completely stock settings with nothing changed whatsoever as it comes out of the box. The second test is a very mild overclock where in MSI Afterburner, which is what was used with all these cards, the power and temperature sliders were turned to max, but no adjustments were made to the actual clock speed of either the VRAM or the GPU itself. That simply allows the card to boost to the maximum allowed without any manual adjustments. The third benchmark was, was with those sliders moved to the max and a plus 100 added to the GPU. 
I tried plus 150, it would not complete the benchmark. Plus 100 was the most overclock this would take, but that did put it really close to two gigahertz. So all things considered, that's pretty reasonable. Let's take a look. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have stock settings. On the right-hand side of the screen, the power and temp sliders are maxed. Notice that the fan speed is a little bit faster on the right side, but the clock speed has a nice, comfortable jump, and there is a performance difference. 53 frames per second average at stock versus 56 frames per second average with the power and temp sliders maxed. That's not bad. That's a three frame per second increase. However, do you really think you would notice three frames per second when the benchmark isn't running? I honestly don't. You can do it, but it's not going to be a big, big change. Now, this next test is with a plus 100 added to the GPU with the power and temp sliders maxed. And holy smokes, we have two gigahertz on the right hand side of the screen. I want you to look at the fan speed, however. We gained 400 plus RPM to the fan speed. Temperature's not too much higher because the fan's turning higher, but I promise you that's a whole lot louder. Performance is better. 60 frames per second average instead of 53. So now we have a seven frame per second jump. Is it worth a 50% increase to the fan speed of the card with the accompanying noise? I'll show you that in just a minute in order to get seven frames per second more speed. Well, that is a more than a 10% performance improvement. So it's very nice, but yeah. As you saw there with the overclock, it makes this card run about the same speed as the factory overclocked versions that are a little bit nicer but the temperature gets higher the fan speed gets higher and yeah it gets louder let me show you all three sound tests Finally, that brings us to the ultimate, the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme 240 millimeter liquid cooled graphics card. As I said before, it is $200 more than the Gigabyte Gaming right here and $100 more than these other premium cards. It's not really worth it on a price to performance ratio. You're not getting that much more performance, but it runs very cool and relatively quiet and it's absolutely gorgeous. Take a look at these results. On the left-hand side of the screen are stock settings, two gigahertz out of the box with a 1000 RPM fan speed. Compare that to the 1500 RPM on the gigabyte card, the base card. Take a look at the temperatures. We're in the low 50s. On the right-hand side, you see power temp and sliders maxed, and you will notice that it makes effectively no difference. It really doesn't. The card is already pre-tuned from the factory to make these sliders pretty unimportant. The real question is what happens when we add something to the GPU clock speed? And here's your answer. On the right hand side of the screen, there's a plus 100 to the GPU. Notice the temperature and the fan speed don't move much. The truth is with this monster cooler on this card, you can push it as far as the chip is gonna go. You're not gonna get 2.2 or 2.3 gigahertz out of it most likely. That's just a limitation to the chip at some point, but each individual one will certainly be able to overclock as far as you can push it. The VRAM would go higher as well, but I didn't test that here because I'm just keeping it equal. The actual performance improvement, two frames per second over stock on this card, 62 versus 60. Now, I did not push the card as far as it would go. It went to 2.1 gigahertz on the GPU. I did not overclock the VRAM because I wasn't trying to separate it out from the others. Maybe I'll come back and revisit it or when I cover it in a build video, maybe I'll do it. You can certainly do so. It's a premium experience with beautiful RGB. And as far as sound goes, I'm gonna show you the sound here. Keep in mind, that my lovely wife, Rogue Storm, was holding the liquid cooler up vertically, which actually put the microphone only about a foot away from the fans instead of two feet away on all the others. Listen to the sound difference with the overclocked and non-overclocked results as much as the actual noise, but it was very quiet overall.
As I said at the start of this video, the advice given here applies to the upcoming RTX 2080 Supers. I will do a comparison of those at some point where I compare the regular 2080s to the Supers, but in general, it looks like it's gonna be about 15% faster than those. If those are the same price as these cards, of course, get the Super version. There'll be a Super Asus ROG Strix, there'll be a Super MSI Gaming X Trio. It's just a boost and a refresh of these cards. However, you might be, be, very well be able to find a deal on one of these cards. If, for example, you find one of these cards for $100 or $150 discounted when the Supers come out, that actually might be the better deal. There's no new features. There's no new big revolution here coming. They're just boosted versions of these cards. So buy whichever one makes sense for price to performance. Thank you all so much for watching my Which RTX 2080 Should You Buy? Comment section below for your comments. There's a like and a subscribe button down there. Please consider smashing those. Links in the video description to all of these products on Amazon and Newegg, as well as the other which graphics card should you buy videos, RX 580, RTX 2060, and a few others will be linked down there. Leave your comments down below. I appreciate you watching, and I will see all of you next time.